Welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's Curator's Corner. My name is Thorne Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Direct at, Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. This online program, as I know many of you already know, was something we started when uh, to share information about objects and items in our collection. And even though our museum is open, and I encourage everybody to come and see these objects and see our museum in person, we're open seven days a week, although we do encourage you to call up and make a reservation in advance so we can maintain social distancing. But please come and see our uh, museum in person. But we're continuing to offer these online programs as a way to continue to share information and details about the items in our collection. As always, before I start, let me encourage you, if you have questions that come up during my presentation, please use the Q&A box and type in your question. I'll make sure to make time at the end of the program to respond. Okay, so today, oops, today I wanted to talk about a photograph that we have in our museum. And as you can see, there is some information on the photograph about what it shows. Here is a slightly blown up version of that section of the image. The German says German Day, 1934, organized by the United German Society. And then in English, it has Madison Square Garden, New York, October 6th. Also included is the name of who, the man who appears to be the photographer, a guy named Carl Lucas, <coughs> who had a photographic studio and in Hoboken at uh, 306 Washington Street in Hoboken, a city that had become dominated by German immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to the point that it was often referred to as Little Bremen. So we have a photograph of German Day celebrations held in Madison Square Garden on October 6th, 1934, likely taken by a photographer based in the German immigrant enclave of Hoboken. Let me say at the outset that the Madison Square Garden of the 1930s may not be the building that comes to mind when you hear the name. There have actually been four Madison Square Gardens. The first was built in 1879 near Madison Square Park, thus the name, uh, on 26th and Madison. More well known is the second building that went up in 1890 on the same site near Madison Square Park, which was designed by the famous architect Stanford White. In 1925, the owners of that property, the New York Life Insurance Company, announced that they would be tearing down the Moorish designed structure to make way for their new office headquarters, paving the way for the third Madison Square Garden that opened on 8th Avenue and 49th Street. So nowhere near Madison Square Park or where Madison Square Garden had been. Uh, and as I'm sure you know, when that building was later demolished, a new Madison Square Garden arose above Penn Station, which continues to operate today. But as I say, our photograph was taken inside this building that stood on 49th Street and 8th Avenue. This is a photograph from 1935, but it captures the entrance to Madison Square Garden. And it looks, I think it would have looked pretty much like this in 1934 when our photograph was taken. The German Day celebration captured in our picture was by 1934 a well-established tradition that commemorated the first German immigrants who arrived in the Pennsylvania colony back on October 6th, 1683 and settled in an area that became known as Germantown that today stands as a uh, historic enclave northwest in, in Northwest Philadelphia. The first known celebration of German Day was actually held in Philadelphia, not surprisingly, on October 6th, 1883, to mark the 200th anniversary of the arrival of those first German immigrants. But in the years that followed, other cities with large German communities, like New York, also started to hold annual celebrations on October 6th. The tradition died out during World War I when anti-German sentiment grew. And as you may know, it was during World War I that there was a real effort in the United States to wipe away connections to Germany. In 1918, a congressman from Michigan went as far as to introduce a bill to strike the words Germany and Berlin from any town or street name in America. 
The law was never enacted, but many cities did change their names during World War I. The anti-German sentiment, however, extended to mainstream commerce. In 1917, sauerkraut producers complained that demand had fallen by 75%, and they asked the Federal Food Board to rename their product Liberty Cabbage. Frankfurters similarly went through a name change and were embraced as hot dogs. And one more example from New York City. In 1911, the Germania Life Insurance Company erected a massively lit sign on the top of their new office building on Union Square. And you see a photo of it here. But with the outbreak of World War I in 1917, just six years later, the company decided that the name Germania Life had to be changed. Because of the investment in the sign, however, they wanted a new name that could reuse as many of the large letters that stood atop their building, and they chose Guardian Life. In 2000, the year 2000, the Guardian Life sign was replaced by a new sign for the new owners. The W Hotel moved, moved in, and so they put up a new sign. But even the current sign is a hint back to that anti-German sentiment that existed uh, during World War I. Okay, I know I've digressed a bit. Let me get back to our photo. The custom of celebrating German Day reemerged in New York in the 1920s with an event in October of 1924 that attracted 5,000 people to the Hotel Astor, which was followed by similar events that I found about in 1925 and 1926. Those events were hosted by the United German Societies, which had been founded in 1899 as an umbrella organization for the numerous German organizations in New York City. And it was that organization who also sponsored and organized the event in our photograph from 1934. There may well have been other events after 1926 and before 19, the 1930s. The next one that I actually found details about was planned for October of 1933. By October of 1933, Hitler had not only been named chancellor, but had gained absolute power in Germany and had passed various laws limiting the rights of Jews in Germany, including the launch of a boycott of Jewish businesses, famously on April 1st, 1933. In the US, the rise of the Nazi party in Germany had sparked a national day of protest on March 27th, 1933, with a massive rally in Madison Square Garden to launch a boycott of German-made goods that lasted until the war started. So with that context, the German Day celebrations planned for October of 1933 took on a contentiousness that had not been seen in previous years. The first sign of that contention was a public announcement that some 2,000 German Jewish members of the United German Societies were leaving that organization because of its pro-Nazi leanings. German Jews felt that they could no longer be part of an organization that supported Nazi Germany. This is 1933. As more information about plans for the event emerged, New York's mayor, John O'Brien, went so far as to cancel the planned program in October of 1933, based on concerns that the Nazi organizer who was to speak at the event would voice some of Hitler's anti-Semitic and anti-democratic doctrines, which would result in disorder. The key speaker who marked, oh, sorry, who sparked Mayor O'Brien's concerns was a man named Heinz Spanknobel, a member of the Nazi party who had immigrated to the United States in 1929 and who had in July of 1933, with approval from the Nazi party in Germany, created a new organization, the Friends of New Germany, that was specifically served, uh, founded as a way for German Americans to support national socialism and the Nazi party in Germany. Mayor O'Brien decided that if Spanknobel was at the center of the German Day celebrations, he was likely going to say things that could only cause trouble and so canceled the event. The uproar about his participation in the New York German Day, Spanknobel's participation in New York's German Day, fed into more trouble for him. He was actually deported in October for, of 1933 for failing to register as a foreign agent and later, after the war, he was arrested by the NKVD, the Soviet secret police, and died in an NKVD camp. 
With Spank Noble gone from the program in 1933, the German community responded by reshaping the German Day event and guaranteeing that it would not be political or inflammatory. Instead of Heinz Spank Noble, the key speaker was changed to the German ambassador, Luther, Hans Luther, who could be counted on to be diplomatic. President Roosevelt was also invited to speak, although he declined. And instead of holding the event at an armory, as it had been planned, it was moved to the Madison Square Garden, which was seen as a less militant setting. With those changes, the mayor allowed the 1933 event to go forward, and German Jews withdrew their opposition. That's 1933. Our photograph captures the event held in the following year. And despite initial appearances, the event actually revealed further divisions within the German population of New York as it struggled to respond to Hitler's rise in Berlin. Before I talk about those divisions, I'd like to look a bit more closely at the photograph. You can see, I think, that there are two main decorations, two main themes for sure in those decorations, the American flag and the German flag, particularly the Nazi swastika, which had been adopted as the new German flag the previous March. My colleague Helen Turner says that when she shares this photograph with school groups and with students, she asks them to count how many American flags they see and how many swastikas they see. I won't ask you to count, but I will say that I counted. And obviously, we're only seeing one portion of the room, and it's taken from a particular angle. By my count, I see, I think, 10 American flags. As for swastikas, there are a couple on the column that stands on the right side of the stage, the left side of the photo. At the far end of the room, there's another one, and one large swastika between the American flags on the right-hand side. And then, of course, a kind of running banner of Nazi flags that extends along the balcony's edge. Uh, eight more just in that one section. A New York Times article described the space saying, the scene inside the building resembled the news photographs of a rally somewhere in Germany. At one end of the arena, a huge platform had been erected. At each side of the platform stood pylons 15 feet high. On one of these was a Nazi swastika, and on the other were German pennants of black, white, and red. Atop the pylons were illuminated bunches of red paper symbolizing the eternal flame of Germany. There was one other part of the arrangement of the room that made the Nazi connection highly visible. If you look closely, I think you can see there are men in some kind of Nazi uniform standing in pretty much every aisle throughout the building. I went ahead and highlighted these uniformed men. The New York Times also referred to them, saying about a thousand uniformed ushers were distributed throughout the auditorium. Their uniforms of black breeches, black putties, white shirts, black ties, and Sam Brown belts recalled the uniforms worn by the special Nazi guards at mass meetings in the Reich. A corps of uniformed women wearing black skirts, white shirtwaists, and black ties also helped to usher in the big audience. You can see the women down on the left-hand side of our photograph. Here's a blown up image there. You can see them more clearly, crisply dressed with their own uniforms. Another notable feature of the decoration in the room that I think you can see in our photograph is a large banner with the German words, Deutschdom Amerikas Erwache, meaning Germans of America awake, a play on Hitler's famous slogan, Germany awake. One last item worth mentioning, I think, in our photograph is a large crowd of men on the stage, a chorus, actually, of some 200 men who added musical entertainment between various speeches. A close-up look shows there's actually a live orchestra, maybe you can see that, I hope so, in front of this group of men, and that the stage includes what appears to me to be some kind of gymnastic piece of equipment or piece of gymnastic equipment, although I have not read about any references to it, but it seems to be standing there. 
As for the speakers who are not seen in our photograph, the most notable was Dr. Ignaz Greibel, a former president of the Friends of New Germany, who served as the chairman of the gathering. He told the crowd of 20,000 that German Americans demanded representation in the American government. And that became the main story that the press coverage focused on. A letter from President Roosevelt was also read out loud in which the president praised the contributions made by persons of German blood to the upbuilding of the country. The use of the term German blood rather than German ancestry or German heritage is I think notable and it is a nod to the Nazi ideology and one that was greeted in 1934 with loud cheers from the crowd. There were other speakers who made thinly veiled anti-Semitic remarks attacking Jewish leaders in New York and there were 500 policemen stationed on duty both inside and on the street outside to be ready to maintain order in the case of clashes with protesters. But the event went off largely without any major clash. In the awake of the event, however, the divisions among German Americans in New York splintered further. German Jews who had already publicly left the main German American umbrella organization stayed away. And a month after the 1934 program, two of the largest German organizations in the city, the Steuben Society and the Friends of New Germany, publicly split and announced that they would no longer be working together. The Steuben Society decided it could not support the rabidly pro-Nazi approach of the Friends of New Germany. Let me just run through a few other events that followed. In 1935, the year after our photo, there were actually rival events for German Day held in New York that reflected the split that I've been talking about. The United German Societies, the group that had organized the event in New York for many years, held theirs in Madison Square Garden on October 6, 1935. The Friends of New Germany, who were aggressively pro-Nazi, held theirs on the following day at St. Nicholas Palace on the Upper West Side. And then a third event was organized in December by the German American League of Culture, a new organization that was actively anti-Nazi. The three events might have been replicated again in 1936, but a wave of government investigations into the Friends of New Germany led to its dissolve, dissolvement or dissolution in early 1936. The German American Bund would take over much of the political space that the Friends of New Germany had established. But in 1936, there were only two major events, one in Madison Square Garden that included a soft pedaled uh, pro-Nazi pitch and the actively anti-Nazi event hosted in December by the German American League for Culture. By 1938, four years after our program was, our, our photograph, the split was even more pronounced as the organizers of the main German Day celebration refused to invite speakers from the German American Bund. One important thing I think to remember, however, when talking about pro-Nazi supporters in New York in the early 1930s is that they did not know that Hitler would undertake the mass murder of European Jews. Nobody knew. By October of 1938, Americans were well aware that Hitler was persecuting Jews in Germany, having revoked their citizenship and forced them from their professions. But this was before the Kristallnacht pogrom of November. There was also ample evidence of Hitler's aggressive expansionist policies, as America has watched as Hitler marched troops into the Rhineland that bordered France in March of 1936, annexed Austria in March of 1938, and then occupied the Sudetenland in October of 1938. But the outbreak of World War II and the invasion of Poland was still a year away. Public opposition to involvement in European affairs was very strong in the United States, not only among German Americans, but in the wider public. Concerns about the economic depression that was still raging in America in 1938, along with xenophobia, anti-Semitism, isolationism, and racism all fed into that equation. Public support for Nazi Germany did change, however, after the attack on Poland on September 1st, 1939. And I was not able to find references to a German day celebration, like the one in our program, after 1938. 
until well after World War II. There was, however, one more major pro-Nazi rally held in Madison Square Garden in February of 1939, which showed how outspoken support for Hitler and Nazi Germany had become. The event was held on George Washington's birthday, February 20th, 1939. It was organized by the German American Bund, the organization which had taken over the membership of the Friends of New Germany in 1936, and it was called the Pro-America Rally. If it wasn't clear in the bigger picture, you can see here that George Washington's image is sandwiched between American flags and the symbol of the German American Bund with the swastika at its center. The point in February 1939 of this event was to highlight some of the racist similarities between America and Nazi Germany, celebrating those. The keynote speaker, Gerhard Wilhelm Kunz, the National Public Relations Director for the Bund, spoke about the long thread of racism in American history to bolster his vision of a whites-only America, citing anti-miscegenation laws, the Chinese Exclusion Act, Jim Crow policies, and immigration quotas. He claimed, quote, it was then always, sorry, it has then always been very much American to protect the Aryan character of this nation. That was his angle on America in 1939. The anti-Semitism that had been muted in 1933 and soft peddled in 1934 was far more visible in this event in February of 1939. That despite the fact that Fritz Kuhn, the leader of the German American Bund, who organized the event, had gained the city's blessing for the rallies, rally by promising that there would be no display of anti-Semitic sentiment and that no speeches would exhibit any anti-Semitism. Regardless of that promise, one of the speakers focused on Jewish world domination and blamed Jews for class warfare in America. Another from California, focused on Jewish control of Hollywood and the news industries. And instead of cheering support for President Roosevelt, as they had in 1934, Fritz Kuhn himself denigrated President Roosevelt, labeling him with an anti-Semitic epithet and referred to the mayor of New York as Fiorello Jew Lumpen LaGuardia. But perhaps the most notable difference between the event in 1934 and the one in 1939 was not what took place inside Madison Square Garden, but what took place on the streets outside. In 1934, there had been a couple of hundred anti-Nazi protesters, but the scale of opposition was completely different in 1939. Some accounts estimated that while 22,000 people gathered inside Madison Square Garden, as many as 100,000 anti-Nazi protesters gathered around the building to protest the Bund. Even if the more conservative or most conservative estimates were accurate, which claimed there were only 10,000 protesters, we're still talking about a massive display of opposition to this event. Recognizing the size of the planned protest, New York City deployed 1,700 policemen to the event, more than three times the number stationed at the 1934 program. Some protesters sought creative ways around the police. The New York Times reported, one of the most mystifying disturbances came from a blaring speaker set up in a second floor room of a rooming house at the southern quarter, corner of 49th Street and 8th Avenue. Shortly before eight o'clock, it began blaring out denunciations of Nazis and urging, be American, stay at home. When the police actually investigated and found their way into the apartment, they found it was empty, but there was a record player that had been set on a timer to start shortly before eight o'clock. Other protests came in the form of letters that were sent to Madison Square Garden and various newspapers. I thought I would share one of those letters, which was sent by the American Jewish Committee. We on the American Jewish Committee the letter said, have considered the question raised by the protest which you've received. The German-American Bund is, in our opinion, completely anti-American and anti-democratic. It is a foreign-inspired organization endeavoring to arouse in the United States the same hatred which in Germany have brought the condemnation of the entire civilized world. Nevertheless, because we believe 
that the basic rights of free speech and free assembly must never be tampered with in the United States. We are opposed to any action to prevent the Bund from airing its view. It is natural today, they continued, when our American system is being attacked from many sides that people should seek to suppress their enemies. We are confident, however, that citizens of the United States will reject all un-American propaganda without resorting to such any such violation of the liberties guaranteed to all by the Bill of Rights. This letter strikes me as still relevant today. We look back at the photograph in our gallery with horror at the public display of support for a government that we know went ahead to murder millions. But we must recall that nobody in February of 1935, let alone in October of 1934, knew that the Nazis would implement the Holocaust. And equally important, one of the crucial things that differentiates America from Nazi Germany, both in the 1930s and still today, is the guarantee of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and the Bill of Rights. While we may wish that pro-Nazi rallies like the one we show in 1934 never took place, the fact is that because the fact is that they did, and that they did is a sign of the freedom which we all hold so dear. I will stop there. Uh, I hope this has been uh, informative. Uh, if you have questions, please type them uh, into the Q and A box, and I'll respond. Before I look at those, let me just put in a plug for some of our other upcoming programming. Next Monday, I hope you'll join us for HMTC's Virtual Upstander Awards uh, and online auction. We're gonna be recognizing really some amazing young people who stood up to peer pressure and intervened to stop acts of bullying. So I hope you'll join us to recognize those young people. Next Wednesday, I'll be back for my next Curator's Corner, speaking about some of the currency from the Lodge Ghetto that we have in our museum. And one more to mention, on Sunday, May 16th at 5 p.m., HMTC is teaming up with the Richard Rogers award-winning musical To Paint the Earth to present a virtual program of music and narration that tells the story of the life of the Jewish underground during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. I hope you'll join me for those programs. You can find more about them or all of our programs on our website at www.hmtcli.org and clicking on the events tab. And I also hope you'll go to our website and click on the give now button to support our operations. Okay, I see there are a couple of questions that have come in. Let me see if I can respond to them. How many people attended the 1935 pro-Nazi event? Uh, the Madison Square Garden numbers are all about in the same. So in 1933, 34, 35, and even 39, we're talking about 20 to 22,000 in each of those events. So a sizable number. The German American Bund, which was a national organization in America, had a, a kind of high note of membership of about 25,000 across the nation. Uh, so I think these events and these ones that were sponsored by the German American Bund or the Friends of New Germany before that, they were gathering support not only from pro-Nazi voices, although these events have such a look of pro-Nazi um, events from our eye, but you've got to remember these were also just pro-Germany events for people whose heritage had been connected to Germany. Still, we're talking about 20,000 people or so in these events. Was Fritz Kuhn and the other American Nazis, did they suffer punishment after the 1939 event? You know, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure what happened to Fritz Kuhn. Um, I'm not sure if he was deported. I, I honestly, I don't know. I'll have to look that up. I'll send you an email though. Um, okay, thanks very much for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you at some of our other programs soon and I hope you have a lovely day. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.